Good morning. What a great opportunity it is to come together, to worship God, to extol and exalt Christ. That's what we're here for. We are here on this earth to remind the world that there is a God. We are here to encourage one another and help one another to get to heaven, to live that kind of life, not just here inside this building, but every day outside this building, that we can touch lives and bring people to the loving grace and the compassion that is Jesus. Years ago, Lee Greenwood said in one of his songs, If tomorrow all the things were gone that I had worked for for all my life, and I had to start again with just my children and my wife. He goes on to say that he thinks his lucky stars, or we might say the Heavenly Father, We live in the USA, but the real question is, is if tomorrow all the things were gone that you'd worked for all your life, including your children, including your wife, those were the circumstances that Job had faced. Job was wondering why. All of his friends were saying, Job, it's because you're such a scoundrel. And yet the entire book of Job is written in a way that we understand it wasn't because he was such a scoundrel. And I've said it before, but I I like to say it often. When it came right down to it and God had a reason for the suffering of Job, and Job had this opportunity to finally have counsel with God, to ask God that question, why would you allow these things to happen to me? And of course, God, who had a perfectly legitimate reason, didn't give it to him. God said, Job, let me be enough. Tomorrow all the things were gone that you'd worked for for all your life including your children and your wife and everything else, let me ask you this question, is Jesus enough? Is Jesus enough for you if you lost everything else and all you had left was Him? Would you be satisfied? Could you be satisfied? In the book of Colossians, Paul addresses the false teachings that are creeping into the church at Colossae sort of a mixture of Judaism and mysticism and, and humanism that, that they seem to want to cram in with Christianity. Yes, they had accepted Jesus as Lord, but at the same time, there were these competing philosophies and there were these other religions and they were saying, well, it's good that you're a Christian, but don't you also understand that you should worship this God or that you should serve the, the elemental forces of the universe? Earth, wind, water, and fire. These were the things that they were were trying to mix in with Christ. And Christianity was so deluding at that time that Paul had determined uh, uh, to write them and to tell them to, to stop following these ways, to remind them of what it means to have Christ. If we were to take the book of Colossians and say, what is the theme of the letter? It is the exalted Christ or the supremacy of Christ, or some have said the preeminent Christ. And all we've done is we've used the same word in different synonyms, an exalted, preeminent, and supreme, meaning that Christ should be enough for us. As we've looked at the book of Colossians for the last few weeks now, we have seen uh, the, the, the great Christ prayer of chapter 1, verses 9 through 14, where Paul is praying for them that they would would, would basically have enough in Christ. And then we saw how he went into, he went from that prayer right into what we called the Christ hymn of chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, that shows why Christ ought to be enough, that in all things he might be preeminent. We see at the end of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2 what we might call the Christ mystery. Now the world is simply confused about things. And yet Christ has stood steadfast all along. But this morning I want to look at the Christ remedy. The preeminence of Christ, 
becomes the springboard off of which Paul dives into the Colossians issues to show that Christ truly is the answer to life. He is the answer to all problems. He is the answer of prosperity. He is the answer of abundance. He is the answer, and he ought to be enough. In this life, there are certain moments we look back on and we say, that's a turning point. Things have shifted. The game has changed. It might be a touchdown. It might be a marriage. It might be a move across the country. But there are those moments in life, those events, uh, those game changers, as it were, which everything after that has shifted directions. We're going in a different way. Paul has spent the first part, the first major division of the book of Colossians, dealing with the preeminence of Christ. And now in chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, we have a turning point. Therefore, as you received Christ, the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Since Christ is preeminent, since Christ is who He is. Paul is saying, since Christ is enough. What does that mean for us? He begins with this phrase, this, this, this transition, as you have received Christ. Paul uses a, a, a style in a lot of his writings and a lot of the answers, and it's, it's referred to as the indicative imperative, in which Paul in, indicates what the state is, and then, based upon the fact that this is the way it is, you must do this, the imperative, the indicative imperative, and this is one of them. As you have received Christ the Lord, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, here He is, uh, uh, that you have received Him, but notice, that's the indicative. He is indicating the case as it is. You have received, what's interesting, he uses a word here for received, with, that is the idea of traditions, to receive tradition, that which has been passed down to you, only in this case, Christ is the tradition. Who he is, is the tradition. As you have received Christ Jesus, notice, the Lord, the Lord. This serves as the first major division, this transition of the first major division of the book where Jesus, Christ Jesus is the Lord. And and, and that is how they had received him when when Epaphras, you look back in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, Epaphras was one who had taught them the gospel. And Paul says that he taught them faithfully. What did he teach them? That Jesus was Christ and Lord. And they accepted that. They received Christ. Those words, and so that indicates how they had received Jesus. But Jesus is not just a Lord, but Jesus is the Lord. In fact, we would go so far as to say Jesus is absolute Lord. There is none beside Him. Paul would write, For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet For us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through whom we exist. 1 Corinthians 1, 8, 5, and 6. There's there's just, for us, one Lord. That doesn't mean that there's not more things that we can put in our lives to lord over us. We have... You know, we, we, have, we are surrounded by people who have put money over themselves. And money has become their Lord. Exactly as Jesus said, man cannot serve two masters. Matthew 6, 24, the last phrase, man cannot serve both God and money. Now notice, Jesus said, you can make money your Lord. Have you ever seen that in anyone's lives? Have you ever seen anyone who serve money as a Lord? It's not that they, they take their wallet out each night and pull out all the cash and all the plastic and build a little shrine to it on their kitchen table so that they can wake up and pray to it in the morning. You don't have to do that to make money your Lord. All you have to do is allow money to make your decisions of how you spend your time, where you go, the friends you 
and the people you interact with, you know, when you start allowing money to make those decisions, you have made money your Lord. Fame, popularity, power and control. There are many things that we can put in our lives to lord over us. But Paul says for us, there's really only one Lord. That is the absolute Lord. Because of the reception of Christ, that is accepting His claims and receiving Him as Lord, Paul gives them the imperative. Remember the indicative imperative. He indicates you've received Jesus. Now the imperative is, the end of verse 6, so walk in Him. What does that mean? It means that our lives are in Christ. For as many of you has been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, Galatians 3.27. We are in Christ where salvation is, 1 Timothy 2 or 2 Timothy 2 and verse 10. We are in Christ. And, and for Paul, there's no hiatus between belief and behaving. Believing that Christ is Lord impels us to behave that Christ is Lord. And that's what it means to so walk in Him, to so live your life that you recognize or continue to recognize that Jesus is absolute Lord. The word walk here is in the present tense, the imperative, present, meaning that we keep on walking. It's not something we simply did on the day that we were baptized. It's not something that we do once a week on a Sunday. Our walk is something that is continual and is never completed. That's the idea of the present tense. That it is not completed. We are never finished walking in Christ. And walking in Christ, so walking in Him, means that we're also rejecting any competition to Him in our lives. Our work families, even our spouses, if they are in competition with Christ as absolute Lord, we are failing to walk in Him. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? That's pretty serious stuff. Now notice Paul's prayer then that he had prayed for them back in chapter 1 and verse 10 that they would be strengthened starts to come to fruition in this turning point. I want you to walk in Him. Well, how is that? Verse 7, rooted and built up in Him and established by the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. This verse comprised of four participles. Those four participles are telling us what walking in Him looks like. The first one is the perfect tense. That means that the action is completed. In other words, our rooting in Christ has been completed. But what's interesting here is it's in the passive voice, meaning it's not something that we actively did, but it is something that was done for us. And we start looking back at our lives as Christians and we're saying, when did this rooting take hold? And we realize it took hold in baptism. In John chapter 3, in verse 5. We are born of the water and the Spirit. And in that moment, we find in Titus 3 and verse 5 we, that we are washed and the Spirit regenerates our spirit. That we are a new people and in that moment, we are added to the church. We are rooted down. The picture is, of course, of a tree. and Its, it's roots are growing deep and deep and deep. And it's forming a strong foundation. When we obey the gospel, God sets our roots deep into the ground. Washing away our sins, He sets us deep in the ground. But second, He says that we are built up in Him. Not only are we rooted, but we are built up. Now, this one goes back to that, that present tense, meaning that it's ongoing. We are continuing to build, so we have, we have in our obedience to the gospel culminating in baptism, we have, we have rooted down into, the, into Christ. But now, again in the passive voice, God builds us up. He builds on that foundation 
that has been made because of our obedience to the gospel. After the roots take hold, God takes over, and Christians are ever-growing, but never complete, just like the walk. We never get to the journey on this earth. We never get to that point in this life where we say, okay, I've, I've grown enough as a Christian. I can't grow anymore. I am the perfect specimen of righteousness and spirituality. That just before the lightning bolt. Number three, established. We are built up in Him and established in the faith. God continues the strengthening again in the passive voice. It is also in the present tense, meaning that He continues to establish us over and over and over and over in the faith. This is that objective faith which they were to continue in in chapter 1 and verse 23 that was once for all delivered in Jude and verse 3. This is that which is taught about Jesus Christ. It is the gospel message, the faith that deserves our defense. God grounds us deeper in His Word, His Word of faith. And He does it through our study and our practice. Sometimes we focus a lot on the study of the Word of God, and that's great. But don't forget that the establishment comes when we put it in practice. That's when we really drill down into the Word of God. I see what Paul is telling me here. What does that look like on Monday? What does it look like on Tuesday afternoon? What does it look like on Friday night? That's the practice. And he establishes us in the faith. His spirit then, he says in in Ephesians 3, strengthens our inner man that we are established now. We are stronger. We are growing up. We are growing stronger. We are thickening, as it were, in God. And then the fourth participle in verse 7, abounding in thanksgiving. Now remember in the first chapter, in the prayer, he he says that that I want you strengthening. I want you growing. And he says, you're going to be bearing fruit like the tree that is rooted. And he ends with, in the fourth participle there, giving thanks. There's an emphasis of Paul on this growth. This time, uh, it is that, that present tense, but this one is active. Where the other three participles were all passive. God is rooting us. God is is building us. God is establishing us. We are giving thanks. We take the initiative. Because we accept Jesus as the absolute Lord, we are admonished to conduct ourselves as those who have been incorporated into Christ. One man said, let Christ and no other establish your values, guide your thinking, and direct your conduct. That's the turning point. The problem is, they weren't quite following that. Verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. This is the danger. See to it, the ESV says. That's a little more passive, I think, than the way Paul is saying it. Uh, It might be better uh, uh, translated, watch out, with an exclamation point or two. Watch out. Make sure your eyes are peeled. Do not let someone lead you captive. Captive is an expressive verb pointing out severe danger. This is what lies ahead. Throughout the rest of the letter, we see the the Judaizing influence and the the philosophizers and the allegorizers all competing with Christ and the gospel. And Paul says, if you give in to them, they're taking you captive. They're putting you in prison. Not a prison for a couple of months or a couple of years, but a prison that is for eternity. Away from the presence of God. Don't let them take you captive. 
And then he says that they're going to take them captive, or what is endangering them is, in the ESV, philosophy and empty deceit. In most English translations, these seem like, a, like two separate ways the philosophers or the false teachers are going to lead them astray. Some are going to use philosophy, and some are going to use empty or vain deceit. And so a lot of people have latched onto this and said, see, uh, philosophy is bad. Philosophy is a word that simply means to love wisdom. Do you love wisdom? If any of you lack, lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally. Do you love the wisdom of God? You're a philosopher. Are you seeking to understand the ways of God's universe? Then you're a philosopher. Paul doesn't here use these as two separate avenues by which they are going to be led captive. He's saying that when your philosophy is empty and deceitful, it will lead you into captivity. Philosophy in and of itself is not wrong. It's what is the philosophy made of. Now, Paul identifies the problem. This is a philosophy that is according to human traditions, according to the elemental forces of the world, and not according to Christ. What has he been saying? Christ is exalted. Christ is preeminent. So what should your philosophy follow? Christ. The problem is they're bringing in a philosophy that is not according to Christ. It's according to human traditions. The interesting thing, the idea here of tradition again, we've already received tradition, the tradition of Christ in verse 6. And now in verse 8, it's competing with the traditions of men. Which Jesus said, if we follow them, our worship will be vain. Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9. Not, or this, this philosophy was according to human traditions. This philosophy, notice, was according to the uh, elemental spirits of the world, the ESV has. This is one of those, those uh, 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 words <laughs> uh, which, which is very difficult to translate. Uh, it can mean like the elements, the material elements of the world. You know, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, things like that. What makes up the universe? And maybe he's saying that we need to be aware of the elements of the world. By the way, spirits in the ESV, there's no word in the original that says spirit. It's simply the elements. According to the elements of the world. But how do the elements of the world lead us captive? That was the great question. And that's still a great question for people today. How does this apply? Now, what some have suggested is that in the course of the philosophies that were threatening the Colossians, there were people, and we know that, that this was certainly a, a, a religion at the time, there were people who basically worshipped the earth and the elements of the earth. And their gods were earth, wind, fire, and water. And so they were telling the Colossian Christians, you need to not only give tribute to Christ or tribute to God, but you need to give tribute also to the water element and to the earth element and to the wind element and the fire element. We have nothing like that today, do we? Listen, we are saturated in earth worship today. So it's not far-fetched to think that there were people in that day, which we already know the religion was there, that was trying to lead them astray by putting more emphasis on the worship of the earth and mixing that with their Christianity. Is that what Paul is talking about? I think that's a plausible explanation of it. Why do they get spirits? Well, about 300 years, or actually about 230 years after Paul writes this, this word, which is translated elements, was a reference to elemental spirits like the angels and the, the, the demons. Those were the elemental or primary spirits, the first spirits that God created. 
Now, that won't come for another 200 plus years, but is it possible those ideas were already beginning to show themselves in the first century? Maybe. Certainly, Paul deals with the principalities and the powers, right? The rulers and dominions. In fact, in this very same paragraph, he's going to get into that in just a minute. So is it possible he's referring to the the angelic realm and the demons which serve the devil? Maybe so. Personally, I think it refers back to the earth worship, but it's certainly not anything we can fall out of. But the, the whole point is, it's not according to Christ. Whatever it, it was, it is not according to Christ. And if instead of trying to identify every possible philosophy, idea, and teaching out there that is not according to Christ and saying, well, we shouldn't do that, and we shouldn't do that, and we shouldn't do that. Why not just embrace that which is according to Christ? And that's Paul's point. There's a danger of being led astray where the gospel is transforming and powerful. Human philosophy is empty. Where the gospel is truth, human philosophy is deceptive. And so let's take according to Christ. Now, why is Christ the answer to all these problems? Why is He the remedy for the error in the church? Paul finishes the rest of this paragraph giving us uh, um, the, these, the answer. He says, number one, because in Christ dwells the fullness of God. We've already seen this in chapter 1 and verse 19. But here in chapter 2 and verse 9, For in Him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Everything that is deity, everything that is divine, everything that makes God God, who He is, His nature, His essence, Him, every bit of that dwelled in Christ bodily. No other. There is no other in which God has dwelled in such fullness. In the transition from the old, where God dwelt in the temple, in the new, deity dwells in Christ. Now, His people look to Christ as our authority. Look to Christ as our Savior. God chose a body. He sacrificed it on the cross. He buried it in the grave, and He raised it from the dead in victory over the powers of darkness. In Him dwelt the fullness of deity bodily. And because of that, we should follow Christ instead of any human philosophy. Secondly, because in Christ we gain our fullness. We reach our fullest potential. Notice verse 10. And you have been filled in Him who is the head of all rule and authority. You, you Christians, have been filled. In fact, he uses the word fullness. Our fullness comes in Christ, whose fullness was deity. He fills us with His grace. John chapter 1, verse 16, For from His fullness we have received grace upon grace, the greatest measure of grace. In Him, He fills us uh, uh, with God's indwelling. In Ephesians 3 and verse 19, And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The Holy Spirit that dwells in us Himself is fully God. We come to our full potential then in Him by submission to His authority. Not the authority of these false teachers and empty philosophers, but in Christ. Christ is the answer because we gain our fullness as Him. Christ is the answer because in Christ we are incorporated with Him. Notice verse 11 and 12 when He says, In Him also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised with Him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised Him from the dead. The carnal is cut away. The old man of sin is circumcised from our hearts. 
He is spiritually removed and we no longer live in the ways of the flesh. Romans chapter 6 and verse 6, that old man is crucified. Once he is crucified, he is buried with Christ in baptism. Romans 6 and verse 4, or here he is buried with him. Or we have been buried with him in baptism. And then like Christ was raised from the dead, uh, we, we experienced the resurrection with him too. Uh, you were also raised with him. The word raised, here's the word resurrection. You were also resurrected with him through faith in the powerful working of God. We believe in God's power. We have witnessed God's power that he's raised us from the dead. And that's why. We should look to Christ and Christ alone. He is worthy of absolute lordship because in Christ we are incorporated with Him, because in Christ we have forgiveness, 13 and 14. And you who were dead in trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by the counsel or canceling of the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. We were dead through sins, through the uncircumcision of our flesh, and God has given us life through the forgiveness of our decaying sins. Our sins were rotting our soul, spirits, and bodies away. And it says that he, he canceled our debt that was recorded against us. Some have asked, who recorded it? The answer is God. God recorded it against us. In fact, the word recorded in the, in the ESV uh, translates the word written by hand. Written by hand. Just as God wrote the old law on the tablets of stone with his own hand. God has written our crimes and sins against us by his own hand. And what God has done is he has, he has canceled that record of debt that, that required punishment. How did he do it? In Christ. In Christ he canceled that debt. He set it aside, or literally, he lifted it, he lifted it up. He took this, this burden of our crimes and our penalties that were inscribed on this written record, as it were, and he nailed it to the cross with Christ. In Mark 15, 26, Pilate writes the crimes or the accusation against Jesus, nails it to the cross. This is why he's dying. The problem was, Jesus was not guilty of crimes and sins. And so what God did is he made another sign. A sign with my crimes and my sins. And he nailed that to the cross with Christ. That's why he hung there. Not for the sign which Pilate wrote but for the sign which God wrote. And along with nailing our crimes and sins against God to the cross, he, he nailed also the legal demands of the old law to the same cross at the same time. We look to Christ. Christ alone is our ultimate Lord as the answer to all problems. Because in Christ, our victory is fully secured. Verse 15. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities, put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Him. By gaining victory over the last enemy, that is death, 1 Corinthians 15, 26, He took away the weapons of the devil. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. That was the devil's great power. And God just ripped it out of his arms. God disarmed the devil in the victory and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He took away the sting of death, sin that the devil holds over us. And so the rulers and the authorities or the devil and his angels or the false teachers and the false religions, they have been disarmed. 
as the ESV says. Their record of accusation against us has been nailed to the cross. It has been, it has been paid in full. It has been rendered impotent. But, but God didn't just take away their authority. God stripped them of their dignity. Put them to an open shame, it says in the ESV. He exposed their impotence to the world. It's as if God, in fact, the, 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 the next phrase, he triumphing over him. It's simply not a translation of the original. The original is that he paraded them through the streets before the righteous of heaven and earth. And he is pointing to the spoils of his wars. These rulers, these principalities, these powers. Look how weak and impotent they are. God is mocking them and putting them to an open shame. God is leading them in his victory parade. Look at the spoils of the world. And Paul says, and now you want to follow them? You want to pay homage <coughs> to these weakened, disarmed, no authority, no dignity. The, the word uh, uh, here, disarmed, really is the word stripped down. This is what they did to Jesus when they put Him on the cross. They stripped Him of His clothing and of His dignity. And God says, look what I've done. Well, that can't be God. God doesn't brag that way. Yes, He does. God says, look what I made. God demonstrates His glory so we can follow. Look what I've done to these foolish, beggarly ways of the world. God is taking his victory laps, but through it he shows the powerlessness of these powerful ones, and he makes plain the magnitude of Christ's victory. They, they didn't gladly surrender to him. They fell before a power they could not resist. That's the Christ, Paul says. That we follow. That's the one and the only one that is enough for me. That's why we look to Him. This is the power of God at work for us. And notice the scarlet thread through all of this. In Him. Go back and look for just a moment. Verse 6. Uh, uh, so walk in Him, rooted and built up. In, in verse 9. For in Him, the whole fullness of deity, you have been filled in Him. In verse 10, verse 11, in Him you were circumcised. In verse 12, with Him buried, with Him raised. In, in verse 13, we have been made alive together with Him. In verse 15, triumphing over them in Him. It is all about being in Christ. That's where the power is. We are reminded to walk according to His teaching and to no other. That's Paul's point. And when you understand Christ for who He is, you realize Christ is enough. He is all we need. And if we find ourselves drifting or backsliding, you know, backsliding or mingling other things or, or whatever else threatens us, remembering Jesus is enough is the remedy. Don't add to. Don't take away. He is the Christ remedy. So are you in danger? Have the ways of the world crept into your walk, giving credence to false religions, accepting human wisdom over God's wisdom, following such things as greed or power or influence or popularity or just plain pleasure over following Christ. These are the devil's tools. They still needle their ways into our lives, no matter how Strong and established and rooted we are today. He's picking away. Trying to take us down. The voice of the devil echoing through modern society, through news, through politics, through religion, through education and scholarship. It's enticing. It's alluring. If it weren't, people wouldn't be led astray. But what Paul wants us to know is that Jesus is 
enough? Is he enough for you? It's the last time I'll ask the question today. But you'll know when you submit yourself fully to him. And if you've not obeyed the gospel, that is the first step. To making Jesus the answer for your life, it begins with obeying the gospel. Or maybe you've already obeyed the gospel, but you, you've fallen back into the ways of the world. That, that happens to the very best of us. I've seen giants in the brotherhood give in to the ways of the world. Don't think that any one of us is immune. But Jesus can be your answer this morning. If you'll respond to his grace while we stand and while we sing. You come with your poor broken heart, burdened and sin oppressed. Lay it down at the feet of your Savior and Lord. Jesus will give you rest. Oh, happy rest, sweet happy rest. Jesus will give you rest. Oh, why won't you come in simple trusting faith? Jesus will give you rest. Will you come? Will you come? How he pleads with you now. Fly to his loving breast. And whatever your sin or your sorrow may be, Jesus will give you rest. Oh, happy rest, sweet happy rest, Jesus will give you rest. Oh, why won't you come in simple trusting faith? Jesus will give you rest.